Okay, cool. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming. This is rad that so many people showed up tonight. Um, just two quick notes before we get started with uh, Chloe and Flannery. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that there's going to be the next uh, show at Sophia Jacob is going to be opening on Saturday, February 23rd, and that's two artists from Portland that are coming to do a two-person show, Chase Beato and Zoe Clark. And it's curated by Sam Corman of White Flag Projects in St. Louis, so they're all going to be out here. Uh, come on out, see their work, talk to them. It's going to be a lot of fun, and then uh, Sam Corman is giving a lecture with our own Deirdre Smith, and that will be the next day, Sunday, February 24th, so I hope to see you guys all there then as well. Um, once again, there is a donation bowl at the front. If anybody can spare anything for the presenters tonight, that would be totally awesome. <clears throat> Uh, so now we get to hear uh, Chloe Murata and Flannery Silva, uh, their presentation. Um, I'm sure most everyone in this room has seen their work in one form or another because uh, they're both super active in Baltimore and beyond. Um, it just seems like these guys have participated in every way, indiv individually and collaboratively, um, from their photography blog to a radio show that I recently found out about. Um, they um, self-publish, they exhibit prints, sculpture, installation, they're involved with live performance, musical performance, spoken word, I mean it just goes on and on, everything. Um, so it's really amazing that Chloe and Flannery are able to do so much for our scene in Baltimore while still completing their degrees at MICA, which is just fantastic. So we're really psyched to present these artists who are at the beginning of their career. So let's bring up Chloe and Flannery. Flannery. We brought a scent with us. Lavender fields. Yeah, we're, we're Forever. Burning, yeah, we're burning some incense tonight in, uh, in homage to Lime and Atelier. I'm Chloe. Chapter two, a teardrop, sad poems. Mommy gave me a drink during my mono. It was pinky and sparkly. It didn't do anything, but it didn't hurt to go down. I liked that time because I just sat places quietly and tried to eat simple and soft foods. Like when my second mother popped me popcorn and I sat in a lawn chair in the grass, staring at the Kirby Mountains, really enjoying each piece slowly. OMG, to think that we own this view of the mountains. Sometimes I love private property. Remember the part in Little Woman when the ice breaks while she's skating and she falls through? That's what the deep woods of this place reminds me of. It's all so melancholy and sweet. Everyone around here waves, a Honda passing a Honda. Down the street, my own private Boo Radley permanently dressed in PJs, gray head pressed up against the glass door, looking both ways, crossing guard of my heart. Really identified with the deaf and blind girl on the Xmas card, finding comfort underneath a hand blow dryer at the local YMCA. Dress up as your character defect, so she wore Spock's uniform, half human, half Vulcan, Vulcans don't feel anything. I don't want to feel anything. Okay, braid my hair. Brush out a hundred knots. My dad on his childhood rocking chair, recently reupholstered, telling me he knows how. But instead I comb his out and make a loose heart braid of gray locks. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Am I married yet? Two eyes that only look at each other. Days gone by. Look at my temporary butterfly, too old for a first kiss. Look at my cancer, a walk to remember, a walk to forget. 
season of the upside down deer. I promise I'll take my spy stroll and my brightest colored coat. I know the posted signs are decaying and God forbid they mistake me for a, a doe. There's a room in my house that I used to tell people was my sister's, but really it holds the trash cans in an empty fish bowl with the colorful rock still inside. For a second I believed that if you believe in God, then your BFF can be your sister. But now I decay how much God has to do with it. I'm not at my best on the balance beam, but I can get my body deformed perfectly around the handspring teardrop trainer. You in the computer chair, me wigging behind you. You're helping me get my life together, typing in the track titles to my most treasured Bjork album. Buddy's poppy wrapped around mom's rear view mirror. Please be quiet, a moment of silence while I change lanes. All flakes welcome on the side of the house not yet renovated. For someone who calls herself a country girl, sigh. I've only ever camped out in the living room. An impulse to take care of you. There's this homemade book from her baby days. She drew her husband as a cripple, and her life work was to be by his side. And the last page said, the and. Want you to be there at the and. It was an anniversary, or St. Valentine's Day. There were red chiseled wooden hearts nailed to the trees lining the driveway. And today I wondered how long it took to take them down. Betty Boop original folk art oil painting, Florencia Man Cave Game Room Landscape. Signed Florencia 1997, $125 on eBay. Thirteenth of November. As of today, I've decided to keep a diary again, just a place where I can write my thoughts and opinions when I have a moment. Somehow I have to keep the hold some, somehow I have to keep and hold the rapture of being 17. Every day is so precious. I feel infinitely sad at the thought of all of this time melting further and further away from me as I grow older. Now, now is the perfect time of my life. In reflecting back upon these last 16 years, I can see the tragedies and happiness, all relative, all unimportant now, fit only to smile upon a bit mistily. I still do not know myself. Perhaps I never will. But I feel free unbound by responsibility. I still can come up to my own private room with my drawing, drawings hanging from the walls, with John Hodges and Bob Reedman and Rod and Bruce and Paul smiling at me from the pictures pinned up over my bureau. It is a room suited to me, tailored, uncluttered, and peaceful. The colors are subdued, peach and, and gray, brown, gold, maple, a highlight of maroon here and there. I love the quiet lines of the furniture, the two bookcases filled with poetry books and fairy tales saved from childhood. At the present moment, I am very happy, sitting at my desk and looking out at the bare trees around the house across the street. The dull gray sky like a slate of icy marble propped against the hills. The leaves lie in little withered heaps, blown in pale orange piles in the gutters. There is a reprimanding sternness in the biting wind. There is no yielding. I see him sweep down the streets in a passion of righteousness like a staunch Puritan minister, a ghost of the old days which never were. I could go on and on. Always I want to be an observer. I want to be affected by life deeply, but never so blinded that I cannot see my share of existence in a wry, humorous light and mock, my, mock myself as I mock others. I am afraid of getting older. I am afraid of getting married. Spare me from the relentless cage of routine and rout. I want to be free, free to know people and their backgrounds, free to move to different parts of the world so I may learn that there are other morals and standpoints besides my own. I want, I think, to be omniscient and a bit insane. That is the trouble with the world. Of course, I can dictate from my judgment seat. Not enough people have that spark of divine insanity that can retwist this crippled frame of existence which deforms us all so horribly. I think I would like to call myself the girl who wanted to be God. Yet if I were not in this body, where would I be? Perhaps I am destined to be classified and qualified. 
but oh, I cry out against it. I am I, I am powerful, but to what extent? I am I. I tape the Comme des Garcons tag for my wallet on my diary cover, like doing that gives it value, the logo. I say it over and over until it becomes something. Comme des Garcons, Comme des Garcons, Comme des Garcons, Comme des Garcons, Comme des Garcons. Rock and rose, rock and rose, rock and rose, rock and rose, rock and rose. I walk down the street and see a poster for a show and I touch it. I should have known that crush, crush was doomed when I texted him, hey, you survived the hurricane? And it took him a week to text back. What do you think of when you read my first and last name? The passage continues with Sylvia Plath examining herself in the mirror, where she reflects on how her own idolized and cherished self-image might come into conflict with the one looking back at her. In a Judy Bloom novel, <coughs> girls always talk about how after they lose their virginity, how when they get home, the first thing they do is look in the mirror, catch their faces in a glance. They always observe their faces look different, change somehow. And that's how it felt, my first set. 627-12. On Monday, I took the bus to Balto to play at X. X met me at Penn Station. I change into my faux leather mini and we take the Hopkins shuttle to Wave, walk up 33rd and then onto Greenmount and then Old York. People slowly start to trickle in. I guess X played, X played my tape for everyone and people had heard it. Like I met this dude X this weekend and he just goes, oh, you're sis, right? I heard the tape. I just started to scream whenever I saw someone I knew. Then X is like, okay, are you ready? I was feeling nervy. I had my Gmail printout and just flipped it to them. I wrote some new gemmas while being here so it felt good to debut them. A circle of shit. And some people were singing along a little, but otherwise it was eerily silent, quiet semicircle in front of me. People I like looking at me like, okay, do it because we know you're gonna, smiling a little. I read into the mic and it felt good, but IDK if it really was. I feel I delivered the lines heavy. It only lasted maybe four minutes. Then I put down the mic and ran through the crowd to have a moment in the red bathroom by myself. Then X came in and was like, why are you just looking in the mirror? Class Menagerie of Blue Roses, 2013. Rock and Rose number two, Style Reader, 2012. Figure 30, Core of Euthydikos, marble sculpture from the Acropolis, Athens, circa 480 BC. Note the heavily painted lips. Chanel's rendition of the Doc Martin's work shoe supports the idea that American taste influences high fashion abroad. Creating distance is another method of protecting the personal self. Sunglasses may be used to create distance. Like a mask, they keep the person's eyes concealed and intruders remain uninformed. Mirrored lenses, the kind that make the wearer look like a state trooper, are most effective in turning back the intruding looks of others. Fur goes well with the draped lines of traditional kimonos. She Never Told Her Love, 1857, by Henry Peach Robinson, a description from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Consumed by the passion of unrequited love, a young woman lies suspended in the dark space of her unrealized dreams. In Henry Peach Robinson's illustration of the Shakespearean verse, she never told her love, but let concealment, like a worm, i.e. the bud, feed on her damask cheek. Although this picture was exhibited by Robinson as a discreet work, it also served as a study for the central figure in his most famous photograph, Fading Away, of 1858. Purportedly showing a young consumptive surrounded by family in her final moments, 
Fading away was hotly debated for years. Robinson was criticized for the presumed indelicacy of having invaded the death chamber at the most private of moments. While addressing the moral and literary themes that Robinson believed crucial if photography were to aspire to high art, this picture makes only restrained use of the cloying sentimentality and showy technical artifice that often characterize this artist's major exhibition pictures. Perhaps intended to facilitate the process of combination printing, the unnaturally black background serves also to envelope the figure in palpable melancholia. How many times has a man looked me dead in the eye and said, do you write? Graph, that is. Graph means graffiti. I'm not a writer like that. I just have a lot of aliases. A locked text file always open on my desktop, entitled sisa.rtf. X is in front of me, writing on a whiteboard on the wall of his living room. He is writing in red. It says, forget on the whiteboard already, smudgy style. I say, write my name, write my name. They all just took mushrooms. I say, write my name, write my name. He begins to, and I say, guess my hand style. He writes a S with an exaggerated loopy cursive flourish and begins on the I and the next S the same way. I say, why do you have to write it in cursive like that? Because I'm a girl? But we are laughing. As he finishes, I read it out loud. Sissa, forget. I named this place Grace's Workshop. I found it while driving down a street in uptown Kingston, home of the Tigers and the first Sonic in New York State. There were curly cursive handwritten signs on newsprint covering the windows. Your sketch, $25, best gift, ready for Christmas, and country crafting, pillows, $9.99, aprons, $14.99. Grace opened the door for me to come inside and she continued sewing an image of kittens onto a toddler-sized t-shirt. The windowsills were filled with still abs of sentimental stuff, all for sale, and towards the back of the room was a big couch covered in stuffed animals. I asked her where she got all of them. She said she used to work for Beanie Baby and Hallmark. She told me that for $9.99 she would photograph me sitting with the bears, a perfect gift for a boyfriend or a loved one. Grace takes a framed photo from the windowsill. It's of her two daughters when they were little girls sitting on their father's lap. The background behind the photo is music notes and holly. She begins to stress to me how important it is to capture a moment. She said she would be so upset if she hadn't captured this moment that she can now hold in her hand. I believe that she's being sincere. I sense a sadness in her little workshop, but also this sweet sense of simplicity. A simplicity of words, a simplicity of lifestyle, a simplicity of love. It reminds me of one of my inspirations, a poetry profile on poemsandquotes.com by a woman from Alabama who calls herself Betty Boop. She titles her poems names like, To Myself From Me, A Teardrop, Angel Eyes, and then she categorizes them. Poems about life, love poems, sad poems, explicit poems. At the end of each poem she writes, y'all let me know what y'all think. I go to the couch and sit with the animals. I place some on my lap and some on my feet. I sit up straight and Grace asks me when I'm ready. I say okay and she takes two photos with her disposable camera. Before the second shot, she said she'll make sure to get my shoes in the picture. The next day when I go to pick up the photos, they are comically off-center. The picture that includes my shoes, she has framed and wrapped a green ribbon around. On the back of the frame is a photo of a painted lion and the words, the Lion of Judah, protect and guide you. As we walk out of Grace's workshop, I admire the window displays again. A drawn portrait of a dog with a red bow tied around his neck. A stuffed bear popping out of a FedEx box. Two smaller stuffed bears with their noses touching like a kiss. On the door, a drawn portrait of a sorrowful looking wo young woman with red ribbons billowing from her half colored in hair. Who is this one of, I ask? Grace tells me it's of no one. You live in my heart, 2013. This is an excerpt by Rock and Rose contributor Diane Young, Diane Young, from a few years ago that still resonates with me. 
When they want you, they will get you. Do you have a fake name? How do you make people forget your name, your real name? Do you have a social security number? Is your name on a lease? How do you erase yourself? How do you erase yourself from the internet? To lose the internet, you must make ties in life which are stronger than the digital ones you have established. Exist outside yourself, in that they will try and find you. They must follow loose ends and chase ghosts. For what we do, we leave signs. Physically, we must leave none. You are very traceable. Deleting history from your computer does not delete anything. Everything action you have made is saved in a database. Easily accessible, but not to you or me. If you are serious, you will try this when you are alone and dependent on yourself. Do not get arrested for anything. Run, run, even if it is a hopeless run. In the past, I have not run. I have stopped and submitted. I have been under their thumb. I have stared into their eyes and watched their lips as they read my entire life of a computer screen. I have apologized when I have not been sorry. Um, a bootleg is a theme I observe often, the urge to have to make it physical. Pictured as a zine spread by Maggie Lee in one of her reading packets, which is like an addition that she is always re-editioning and giving to people. The following spread is Xerox from a spread of Maggie's photos in Vice magazine. Though a popular glossy mag in print, Maggie felt the need to Xerox it and bootleg it. A quote from this reading packet edition. Printmaking is my choice of tool. I like the idea of sharing on a small scale where many can see, nevertheless only a few can have to cherish. Ceramic Microphone 2012. Sometimes I wrote this song about two people in the audience at the show. Sometimes I think one of them might walk in or be there that night. This is a song called Toy, and I wrote it about you. Caricature of me is Rory Gilmore from Gilmore Girls. Caricature of me is Jean Louise Scout Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird. Caricature of me is Jamie Sullivan from A Walk to Remember. Caricature of me is Holly Sargis from Badlands. Caricature of me is Laura Wilder from Little House on the Prairie. Caricature of me is Lana Distel from Boys Don't Cry. Caricature of me is Molly McIntyre from the American Girl doll series. Caricature of me is Laura Wingfield from The Glass Menagerie. Spider Island, or Lonely, Lovely, by Robert Little. Angel Applicant, 1939, Paul Clay. It seems doubtful that this angel applicant, resembling the offspring of a bulldog in a Halloween mask, will ever reach heaven. In 1939, Clay composed 29 works that feature angels, having in earlier years only sporadically depicted them. His angels were not the celestial kind, but hybrid creatures beset with human foibles and whims. Clay's angels are forgetful, still female, ugly, incomplete, or poor, as the titles he gave these pictures indicate. Each of Clay's angels is flawed or missing something, and hangs in a state of limbo where trans Transcendence is impossible. There's forgetful angel, a simpleton messenger who fails to remember the details of important information. Another angel, still female, looks askance at her own body, which retains breasts when it ought to be androgy androgynous. The angel applicant has a mask-like face that tilts towards the moon, peering with hollow, unseeing eyes.
from Hot Buttered Soul, number 27. Editorial. If the color of the paper dazzles you, don't blame me. It's not a permanent thing. The bad news is that my usual supplier is not stocking paper anymore, and this was purchased out of desperation. However, I am unable to get any more paper at the price I have been used to paying. From now on, each ream will cost 55% more, so unfortunately, we're going to have to spend more. Add to this to the fact that stencils have gone up, also duplicating ink, staples, envelopes, as well as the extra on postage. At first sight, it looks as though the cost of hot buttered sole would have to rise to about 18 and a half pounds a copy, which is not a very mathematical number to multiply by six or 12. I could round it up to 20 pounds, but I am not prepared to make money out of hot buttered sole in any form. The cost will stay at 15 pounds for as long as possible, even if it costs me money. However, for the next six months, all monies received for sales on my records will go into the Hot Buttered Soul Fund and not into my pocket. My latest list is enclosed, 300 goodies, so please buy something. If anyone can give me addresses of paper slash stencil suppliers, I would be the most grateful. Help keep the mag on its feet. I already know one guy pays 15 pounds an issue to keep his magazine in circulation, and another glossy mag is seriously considering going back to duplicating. Don't let your friends read your mag. Get them to buy one of their own. We do have a massive readership, so all you large clubs, etc., why not advertise with us? In an effort to economize on paper, I've dropped our annual poll and our index to the past 12 issues. Perhaps something will come out at a later date. Right on. Rock and Rose skirt with Rock and Rose wall hanging, 2013. No one knows exactly how the next look will evolve. Invariably, bear some way you move. Break the rules and avoid perfection. Fashions of the future echo of the past, though they're never repeated. We told ourselves it was just for fun, and that we, everything seems to be in at the same time. Today we are trying to come to grips with punk and Norma Kamali. When tie-dye was part of hippie regalia, it seemed clever and artistic. But when it went mainstream, it lost its charm. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Can't see. Hey, Q. Uh, so you guys, uh, you were just like these ideas of nostalgia and kitsch a lot of vehicle to your work. I was wondering what the choice lineup was, or why why you pursue that instead. Why why we use like nostalgia and kitsch? Like why that's a reference? Yeah. Do you wanna? Um. I don't know, I feel like the, the word kitsch, I don't like to uh, associate with, because um, I don't think that my interests are kish, kitsch. Um, but in terms of the nostalgia, I've been thinking about um, kind of the different ways I've approached that throughout the years. Um, and I think probably in the past, four years, like the beginning of this lecture was um, kind of a, a span of time that I haven't really gone back to, um, opposed to like four years ago, um, going through like footage of my childhood of that was basically all on tape. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the nostalgic aspects are definitely um, something I feel closest to and to kind of return to 
um, my interests in the past and kind of how they're relevant now. Yeah, I feel like for me it has to do with always, everyone always like, oh, well, um, like you missed out on punk, that was in the 80s, you missed out on this, you know, I mean, no one's ever said you missed out on the rave scene, but you know, you missed out on like every, <laughs> on you know, every subculture and, um, you know, our pre-internet, um, just always looking back. And um, in terms of like, you know, fashion, trends or like style, you know, always, it's like there's like, you know, the 20 year gap, the 30 year gap um, of like in, you know, 2012, people being really into the 70s. But um, I think a lot about how now we're kind of like almost chasing our tail, like people are dressing, like 2002 is like ironic, I feel like, in like in like fashion regards and styles. and. Um, and I think that like hyper nostalgia is something that um, the internet and um, has certainly contributed to for people our age on the net. Yeah, I think I think a conversation that we definitely are always having is how to s how to look back while still staying true to the fact that we're in 2013. Can you talk more about the uh, Rock and the Rose? I, I understand that it's a publication, but also seems to flow to your work in other ways. Can you just like describe that? Yeah. Um, so Rock and Rose is my magazine, and um, there's been three issues, um, and all the contributors are anonymous. Um, so when I I said Diane Young before, it's like a pen name, um, and I. I ask the contributors to have pen names because um, I feel like I'm always looking at like lists of publications of like the contributors and it's like a certain list and a lot of times you'll see like the same list, like the same names over and over again or you'll say like, oh, it's like they're in this publication or you'll know the names and um, I think I wanted like the viewer to come to it without that, like, like it was like an artifact from like another world, um, uh, and, but it's my friends <laughs> who write for it um, and some other people who I've met through the internet. Um, and the Rock and Rose logo, which is printed here, um, screen printed on this canvas, um, is, um, the first issue just said Rock and Rose yeah. on it, and then this logo is the word rock over the word rose, and I've sort of started to think about like the Rock and Rose brand and what that is, um, and incorporate that in my work. Yeah. Anyone else? Chris. Oh, hey. Hey, what is, um, I don't know, where do you see the uh, Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I can talk first? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. I think. Well, someone wanted me to like do like a like a spoken word poetry like rap set, and they were trying to and it, they were trying to like give whoever was booking the show like an example, and they gave them my Tumblr, and I felt. And like the guy who's the booking the show was like, what, is she just gonna read her Tumblr? Like what, like he was really confused about it. Um, and, um, and, I was, and I was immediately like, oh, well my Tumblr's not my set, like come on. But I think the, the stuff, I don't read my Tumblr, but the stuff like on my Tumblr I think of, and I think Flan thinks of it this way too, is like just kind of like behind the scenes like notes on, art making and um, life and love. And, um, but I think there's like a conversation that um, comes up a lot is like, like our friend is, was making a photo blog and he was like, 
oh, like, he's, like, new to, like, the internet realm, I guess. He's making this blog spot, and he's like, oh, like, should I put the good stuff online? Or, like, do I save that for, like, when I have a gallery show? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, um, <laughs> you got to do what you have to do. But I think there's this feeling of, like, like, I make magazines, like, I screen print them, and there's this thing of the physicalness, like, you hand it to someone, and to me that always, like, matters more than what's online and I mean I always read like you always hear like interviews of like people who made zines in like the 80s or the 90s and they're like well why like you have a blog like why do you have to like make a magazine you know because that's like how you know it's supposed to be like really quick like you hand it to someone and it was like the fastest way to get your, th your thoughts out. Like I'm thinking about like, like riot girl zines, you know, like you hand out and it's like everyone knows your feelings and, and like, your, like your, your thoughts. But, um, and so now it's like obviously the blog would be the way to do that, but there's something about like the physical handing out like a magazine that just is really important to me. And, um, and it's also like not a novelty, like I feel like sometimes like in crits with older people sometimes, they say like, oh, like, that it's like funny that I make a magazine, but I feel like everyone in this room like makes magazines and hands them out and yeah, the physicalness is really important. Yeah, I think also, um, like I know that just kind of being conscious of, I feel like what's on, what we put out on the internet is, is um, maybe not as like precious as what we want to be in print or in like a fine art context of um, kind of what's been ingrained in school. But um, like I know that when when you're talking about magazines, you don't want any of the information to have been seen online mm -hmm. previously. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of the mother daughter vacation blog, it's kind of just. Um, documenting our weeks and the pretty things we find mm -hmm. and say. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank Thanks. you.